What's up, guys? Hey, so we're streaming on Facebook. Going round two. Make sure that you guys turn on your notifications if this is showing up on your phone down below. I'm going to try this again with Jeff Cohn. Uh, there we go. I hear you now. So we got it rocking and rolling, guys. Um, if you guys are hopping on, thanks for being here. Make sure to uh, put an L in the comments down below if you're watching live or an R if you are watching the replay. Jeff, um, welcome to the show. Real quick, share with us in 90 seconds or less how you went from where you were to where you're at today, and then we'll roll with questions from there. What area of my life? <laughs> uh, so we want to talk about business, number one, on, right. on this. So let's talk yeah, about let's business. Let's kind of playing with you a little bit. Yeah, um, all right, you little goofball, you. And a little tiger. Yeah, man. So it comes down to the three pillars of growing any successful organization that, in my opinion, is number one, recruiting talent. Number two, investing in that talent by creating value, which helps you retain them. And then number three, continually training them. And that applies to both your admin staff and it applies to your agent staff. So um, we've just kind of tested a lot of things and filled forward over the last seven years, taking us from 70 to over 700 sides last year. Uh, it was about 135 million in gross volume. And that was about 3.2 million in uh, gross commission income. And I, was, I had a team last year that ended about 45 agents. Um, I have probably 20 full-time, about 25 part-time. We now have teams within teams. Uh, we have weekly accountability meetings, two, two weekly trainings every week. Um, all the systems in the world to help them be the best they can be in the least amount of time with the least amount of effort. And our average agent last year made $80,000 and sold 29 houses. So it sounds like you pretty much created um, the Mormon church inside of your business. Like it sounds like you, you have these missionaries <laughs> with the zone leaders and the division mm. leaders and, and you're just growing it that way. Yeah. You know, it's um, funny. I, I, I would not deny that that's probably kind of what, what I did. The Mormon church kind of has it figured out. Um, yeah. They can, they can run a, a mission of 300 foot soldiers with only two leaders at the helm. Um, that's the adult leaders. And then they have young male leaders that are 18 years old, but you know, that's my infrastructure. I have two direct reports yeah. um, and then we've got a, the, the army on the ground and we'll hold them accountable. So you've been in business seven years. Um, I've been my, I've ran my real estate team for seven years and then I was an individual agent for six years. So I got licensed okay. in 2006. How young are you? I'm 36. Okay. 36 years old. All right, cool. And, um, you, I think, I, I think it was Pat Hyben that first introduced me to you. I think a couple yeah, of years probably. ago or a year and a half ago. Yeah. And, uh, you served a mission in Brazil. Is that yeah. right? If I remember right. Yeah. All right, cool. Where, where'd you go on your mission? Well, say Tom, eh? Uh, eu, eu fiz my missão no Rio Grande do Sul, Santa oh, Maria. Cool. He said yeah, he started his so. mission in Rio Grande do Sul, Santa Maria. Yep. So I was mission uh, Florianopolis, Santa Catarina. All right, cool, dude. I freaking did a, another mission in Santa Catarina, uh, Floripa, but um, it was like a whole other version of my life when I went back in 2010. So I had I was in the church and then I had totally left the church, and so it was like a whole other world in 2010. I was there, but Floripa. <laughs> freaking rock the beaches there are amazing and was an amazing experience so yeah, um, it was amazing i haven't been back either it's funny dude like 36 is kind of a weird age because for mormon men it's you've lived two lives essentially up to your mission and then now mission to today and then you're also yep. twice as old as you were when you graduated high school so it's kind of a weird time <laughs> it's like yeah it, it totally is a weird time at it this is. age. It is a total weird time, but it, you know, I look back in those two years and it's so cliche for anyone that is, uh, that knows the, the, the LDS church and the Mormons, but best years of my freaking life, hands down, uh, two of the absolute best years of my life. Yeah. So let's go back to the business topic then. So 2011, that was, and I don't know about Nebraska, but that was the probably the bottom of the market for most of the part of the country after the the, the big recession. Yep. What is it that you started shifting your mind and and shifting gears to go from single agent to hey, I want to scale this? Yeah. So my biggest thing was I individually knew what I had to do to be successful. And starting in 2006, the market started to fall, and then seven, eight, nine, it got horrible, and everyone was watching me continue to sell more and more real estate as an individual agent. 
and not having any idea how when I was, you know, I'm a young kid in their minds for any realtor under 30, that's young with the average age of agents being like in their late fifties. But I was doing all the unorthodox stuff, like using social media at the time was like, nobody had done that yet. Um, I was using YouTube to shoot videos of my properties. Um, I was actually calling expireds and for sale by owners, but people were so lazy because they were used to the good times when it was a seller's market in the early 2000s that a lot of the veteran agents weren't doing these unorthodox practices. And so when we decided to launch the team, my real focus was putting myself in a position where maybe within 20 years, I could stop selling. I didn't think it would happen within two years. And I wanted to just give the agents all of the ammunition that I had been taking advantage of that had helped me get to where I was. So my mindset was, I'm going to find all these people that I'm going to partner with. Um, I killed my name. It was the cone team. We became our tagline, which is Omaha's elite real estate group. And I found a bunch of people to partner with me and we create, and I say partner with me, I own the company, but they'd come under the team and I'd say, Hey, come help me join, you know, come join my team and help me build the number one team in Nebraska. And that was kind of always my vision. And we were able to do that within three years. So when you do 700 units, what does that look uh, volume sales wise? That's 130. That was last year was 135 million in volume. Okay. Our average sales price is about 200,000. Okay, cool. Hey, do you, is, is, do you, are you a pheasant hunter in Nebraska? It seems like you did pheasant hunter. It was really good. I did it a lot, a life ago, uh, back when I was in high school. Now I'm more, we do waterfowl, like migratory birds, like ducks and geese. Okay. So in, in my, in my previous life, I was way more focused on waterfowl, like three days a week, like oh, really? I just consumed with it. And then it was actually weird. Actually, I came home from my mission and did, I did South Dakota a couple more times after that with some pheasants. Cause I really love upland game, but yep. like I had this weird thing. I remember we were shooting birds on the bear river here and like, we were slaying them that day. They're just, we're just doing pass by shooting. And like, I realized like I didn't like to kill things anymore. And then after that, <laughs> I just stopped. It was weird because I'm not going to eat ducks or geese. Let's, I don't know right. if you're eating. No, no, I'm not eating like, it. Yeah. I don't keep right. it. No, man. And honestly, like, this is a joke. I, I don't remember the comedian that talked about this, but they joked about how men traditionally will go golfing for four hours and it's not really about the golf game. It's just hanging out with the boys. Same thing, yep. hunting, same thing, fishing, same thing, wakeboarding, the sports fun. That's like what brings everyone together, but it's really just getting a mastermind and because, you know, get to know people better and share it in, in those experiences. But there is also an amazing adrenaline rush when you've got 200 geese, like hovering over you, setting down in your, tell me it's not an amazing no. rush, Jeff. Is it? It's a rush, rush, but honestly, like you, to your point, if you didn't want to kill the animal, you could pop up and videotape other people killing the animal. And it would be as exciting, if not more exciting, yeah. if you like taking pictures, as long as you're okay seeing the animal die. <laughs> yeah, well, and making sure that those animals aren't buried in the mud, but actually eaten and taken care of. Like, because that's oh, what yeah. we used to do. We used to give them away. So we are so far off topic. It's I, okay. You're just such an interesting <laughs> dude. So going back, 135 million last year, and we're on target for how many this year? You yeah, know, so the, we're down 15%. Um, our market's down about 17%. Uh, it's a seller's market. It's a strong seller's market here. We only have about a month of inventory. And so we generate about f- uh, 2,000 buyer leads a month through about a, a $10,000 a month ad spend. And all the, we have all these buyers that we're actively working that are still in multiple offer situations, losing out on houses. So it's interesting. The market's down because the inventory is so low. The market's yep. not down because the market's not good. But by the yep. inventory being low, it's caused the market to be bad for buyer's agents. And so we're putting a new emphasis on you know more listing lead generation, um, reaching back out to your sphere. We've been doing that for years, knowing it was pivoting into a seller's market. And now, as most people talk about over the next 12 to 18 months, we think it's gonna soften and start turning back into a buyer's market. So I haven't wanted to put the brakes on what we were already doing right, because I think it's gonna pivot again and we're prepared for that pivot. I'm actually wanting that pivot, I'm waiting for it. Yeah, and you know, I think it's it's starting gradually, at least in our market in March of California, we've got some some bigger clients coming in from California doing flips here. Um, but it's, it's interesting to see how the different markets are shifting. So I wanted you to dispel a myth, right? Cause I think that there's this myth, everyone wants to either build a big team and, and not work <laughs> or, or something. I don't know what, I don't know what they're, they're, they're thinking. Right. But like the moment you started building your team and like where you're at today, did you just like stop 
working? Is that what like it means to build a team with 45 agents and 135 million volume? Or is that a myth that people think that like the team leader doesn't work? Yeah. So the hardest thing with running any business is you have to put systems in place so the business can run without you. And if the business can't grow without you, then whatever your role is, that's a job. True businesses have the ability to continually scale without your your work need, needing to be part of it. And so I, in the beginning, I, like I told you, I thought I'd be working. I thought I'd have a job for 20 years um, and that I would be necessary. And, you know, I found a lot of satisfaction in being necessary. I, you know, a lot of my identity was tied to being this agent that sells a lot of real estate. And so it was really hard in the beginning. And then I started spending a lot of time looking at how, I, where I wanted my life to go, the type of person I wanted to become, um, kind of the bigger picture visioning for my life. And I recognized that I didn't need to be this successful realtor to be able to feel val validated. I would rather be able to be a successful dad and be in better health, both mentally and physically, and be able to go hunting and do the things I love. And so I started to become obsessive with not selling real estate because I already knew how to do that, but I had to trade time for money to be successful at that. I became obsessive with finding the right people that I thought could replace me and be able to do as good, if not better of a job than I was able to do. And so I hired, of course, my first hire was an um, administrative assistant who did all my back office paperwork. Second hire was an operations manager and marketing director, Kevin McGowan, who's now a business partner of mine. He did an amazing job. Um, third big hire was... Um, a success manager who was like an office manager that held the agents accountable. So with the success manager and the ops manager, I essentially took care of the back end of my business and the front end of the business. So this is a long answer to a very short question. I had to have two jobs essentially in the beginning because I kept selling real estate because I needed the money to be able to float this dream of mine, which was having a team. But of course, that team overnight wasn't going to start making me money. I was fortunate enough that within 12 months, my team went from 70 to 240 unit sales. But I hired a ton of agents in a very short amount of time and threw a lot of leads at them and held them accountable way too much. I drove people away because of our obsessive tracking. And we had daily meetings for two hours. So it's been a learning experience. But to answer your question, man, for anyone listening, like if you're thinking you want to go the team route, you don't have to go as quickly and aggressively as I did. But you're not going to be out of the game. And I always tell people until your team nets you the same amount that you netted your best year. So once your team nets you, let's say it's $300,000, then you can give yourself permission to quit working as a real estate agent and then start focusing on being a business owner. Yep. So let's talk, let's talk about that. Uh, and I want to do a quick, uh, a quick plug. Cause I know you work with them and spring is an awesome friend of mine, but you track a lot of your stuff with Sisu. Is that correct? Or am Absolutely. I still far off on it? Yeah, yeah, so, Sisu, Sisu uh, we just adopted Sisu about six months ago. Uh, and it is, you guys, if you haven't checked it out, it, like we have been freaks about analytics. Uh, ever since the beginning, I've used master databases and I took stats classes in college that I tied into my company right away when I first got licensed. I wanted to know how many showings I had to go on with a buyer before they go under contract and how much time it took me to list a property. Like anything that could be tracked, I tracked it. And that uh, spreadsheet turned just turned into gold because we could make decisions based on the information we derived from it. Sisu is that on steroids. So it empowers your team. Each agent can have like their own dashboard that tracks their analytics. They can know what percentage of their deals come from each lead category. There's dashboards, like there's gamification where the team leader can set goals for outbound calls or appointments that someone goes on. So it's been a huge game changer for us. And I know, um, do you have a, a link you ask people to go to to do the demo. I know, you know what, dude. I I'm not even an affiliate, so if you've got one, come and drop it in the comments. I'm just like yeah. super good friends with Brian and cool. Spring, so uh, yeah, Jeff, drop the link. It's Jeff's favorite tools .com. So go cool. to Jeff's favorite tools .com and that's all the different companies I work with. If you go through that portal, they'll waive some startup costs that are normally associated with it, but it's cheap. Like for an individual agent, it's thirty dollars a month. Yep, it's super inexpensive, yeah. and it, it's super it's powerful super software. Cool. Awesome. So shifting gears, then um, you, you, you expanded quickly. What is that hiring mode? Like, let's let's not focus on like the admin, because I, we all know that's where you got to start. But when you start bringing on salespeople, yeah. how do you find the right people? Number one, but number two is how do you feed them leads? What, it sounds like you had to really put some investment into this, not just yeah. hope it happened. Right? So back to the analytics, we started to figure out that we needed to give an agent around 30 internet leads. These are Google ads, Facebook ads, and Craigslist ad leads. 
we needed about 30 leads to help an agent convert one deal a month. So we're at about, we were at about a 3% conversion ratio when we were sending agents 30 leads a month. So I wouldn't add a second agent until I had an additional 30 leads to give to them. And I can build, I can create leads all day long. Like lead gen is the easy part. Finding agents willing to work the leads the right way so that they'll convert at 3%. That is the hard part. That is the work that a lot of teams are struggling with right now across the country. And so we became masters at knowing how to generate the lead the best way, the best leads that would take the agents the least amount of time to convert, and then holding the agents accountable to working the leads the right way. And so we knew we needed to add more agents when we had more leads. And then we knew we needed to add more staff when we had more agents converting more leads. And it broke down to about every 300 unit sales was an additional full-time admin position. So right now we're at two full-time. We run dot loop for teams for back office contract to close management. And then we knew on the front end, I needed about 30 leads per day per agent that was wanting to take lead day. And they just take lead day once a month. So the promise we ultimately would make to someone that wants to join our team is if they join our group and they choose to take our leads, they should do 12 additional unit sales a year, one a month off of these 30 deals we give them every month. And then our hope for them is that they would do one deal a month off of their sphere of influence and one deal a month out of their own prospecting efforts like open houses or expired FISBO calls, which is a net total of three deals a month, 36 deals a year. With our commission split, that ends up netting them about $100,000. So our, pro- our whole vision is, hey, we'll help you make six figures, do three deals a month. One of those three deals is going to come from leads we generate. And when you get to a point where you don't want to work the internet leads any longer, we'll actually teach you how to build a team within our team. And you can send those leads off to those agents that are on your team and make a percentage of all their sales. And so I now have 10 okay. teams within my team. Okay. And then, then are, once those get to a stage, are they going to build teams within the teams? Within we won't the let them go another deep. Nope. But they can leave with their team leaders blessing. They can leave and come onto my team and become team leaders if they want. Oh, okay, cool. So then people can break off and then launch their own team with inside of your team. Yep. Okay, cool. So let's talk about how do you find those individuals on to, to join your team? And you're probably not doing the recruiting. I would imagine you're not the main recruiter for your team now, or you kind of are. Or? I spend about a day a week with Omaha's Elite. I own five, I own like eight businesses, but there's five that I put a lot of my time and energy into. Omaha's Elite's obviously one of them. It still continues to be my number one <clears throat> uh, income source. And it's where it kind of feeds a lot of my other business entities. So like we have title and insurance, which it feeds very easily. Um, I also own a flipping business that acquires and flips around 80 properties a year. And so of course we use our real estate team to facilitate that. And then I've got a call center in the Philippines, thousand calls a day, uh, which helps oh. agents and investors. Is that, your, is that your company? I own 33% of it. Okay, cool. So, um, yeah, who's your who's your homeboy that set this up? Is it Braden? Is that his name? Braden, yeah, thousand calls hire, hires Braden. He does kind of marketing outreach and um, puts us on podcasts and stuff like that. So that's my shameless plug. I have to talk about thousand calls. You guys, if you're not using a company to make your app on prospecting calls and you're wanting to get in front of more people, they literally make. I came up with the name. Why is yep. it called thousand calls a day? They make a thousand dials a day. And they get 10% okay. answer rate. So they talk to 100 people a day. But what's awesome is those 900 calls that they don't connect on, they can drop voicemails that you pre-record. Yep. Yeah, so Who what's up? You? It's Colton. Just you know, calling the neighborhood, looking for sellers that want to sell. We have tons of buyers. Call me back. I mean, it's super simple. So just cold calls then? Yeah, they just do cold calls. They can scrub. They can scrub an already existing list if you want them to scrub leads that you've already yep. generated. But we've, we've found the people that are most successful with them are just making cold calls. They could do expired, FISBO, just listed, just sold, circle prospecting, anything the agent wants. Okay, cool. So um, Jeff Latham, is, is he just one of your clients or is he involved in the company? Because I did an interview with him, Braden had set up too. Oh, cool. Nope, he's one of our clients, one of our top clients. Okay, cool. Yep. So, um, dude, yeah, let's, let's, I'll reach out to Braden or chat with you guys because I didn't really realize what you guys were even doing. I just know that Braden's like, hey, can we get this guy in your yeah. podcast? We get this guy in your podcast. It's pretty cool, like, man. I mean, we've got 150 full time virtual callers that service about 100 real estate teams all across the United States. And this was like a grassroots effort. Like, we, we didn't even start spending money on marketing until like six months ago. It was just kind of a wor- word of mouth. Our biggest fear was growing too fast and not being able to offer the value that was deserving um, that each of our clients we hoped would would receive. And that's one of the challenges right now. You can go on Elance and find a virtual caller for three bucks an hour, but you're going to hold them accountable. You're going to manage them. You're going to provide them with the dialer. 
you're not gonna, they're not gonna do a good job ultimately. And so we wanted to come up with a solution where people could hire a virtual assistant that was managed by us. So we actually don't even provide, we help you hire a VA, but the contracts between you and that virtual assistant were actually a management company that manages other people's virtual assistants. So even someone listening right now, who's like, well, I have a VA, but I'm not, I'm not doing a good job managing them, which we don't blame you. You hire us to manage them for you. And it's like, I think it's less than a thousand dollars a month, the management fee. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. So I was just pulling that up. So outbound telephone prospecting, new client onboarding. So there's a $14.95 upfront cost. Is that what it is? I don't do the sales calls. It's been like over a year, so I better not jump into saying what the pricing <laughs> so is. So you but... have no idea. So the website is that, yeah, so it's fourteen ninety five up front, right? And then eighteen fifty per month uh, for, looks like for a full-time VA, 40 hours a week. That's on average 450, 70, 750 calls a day. So awesome, man. That's really cool. I didn't even know, realize that's what you, you guys are doing. I mean, that's it's one of the doing. things. Yeah. So we've got, you know, I, for example, just to break this down for you guys, when, for anyone listening. So my flipping business in Omaha spends, we spend $2,000 per caller per month. One caller that's cost two grand, about 1850 can make 22,000 dials to the list we send them. So depending on the type of calls they're making, they can't make that many dials, but if they're just cold calling, they can make $22,000. We get 10% of the people answering Colton. So that's 2,200 people that answer. And then they have a simple script just saying, Hey, would you want to sell your house in the next couple of months to some local investors that live in town that want to refurbish it for sale or that want to hold it as a rental and six people say yes. And then we go on six appointments and make six offers that are 30% below market. And one out of the six accepts it. So we're converting one out of every 22,000, but our average return on that one is $24,000. And we have done this, we're buying about 10 houses a month right now. So the numbers wow. are insane, like more than 10X. And so like a lot of people that use this for like expired FISBO to generate listing leads, you look at most commissions, the average listing commission in the country is probably $7,000. So yep. if every three months they turned over one rock that sold, you'd still be turning a profit. So the people that don't make it work are the people that don't follow up with the leads, which is most agents. Yeah. So the clients that leave us were, are like, yeah, the leads weren't good. And so we'll be like, well, did you call them back ever? We're like, well, I'm busy. You know, it's easy to work the referral from grandma. Like, you know, that's a slam dunk, but to work right. some random referral from a stranger in the Philippines, you're just a little more suspect, I think. And people so, don't. So Trust you're it. doing it. You're using this for your own flips. Did I understand that right? Uh, we we use it for our team as well. We have a virtual okay. caller. There's some laws so, uh, though regarding outbound prospecting with virtual callers. Each state has different rules. Um, yeah. so we can't use the virtual caller to make cold calls. If we're using the virtual caller on my team, it's just to follow up with leads that are already that we're already working with. Yeah. So that depends on what your state is and, and yep. the state laws. And when they like sign that. up on our squeeze page on Boomtown, they agree that we can call them back. So we can't make cold calls in yep. Nebraska. So are, can you, can you, can you do cold calls to purchase properties in Nebraska? Like if you're buying these properties? So we... a non-licensed um, assistant cannot legally in the state of Nebraska. Um, but if you're buying for yourself, like if you're an investor, you are allowed to make up on prospecting calls, but it's gray, man. Like I've even been back and forth with the attorney um, here at the real estate commission and we're still discussing it because I know there's hundreds of investors in Omaha that use third-party callers for outbound prospecting. But technically if you're procuring a listing or sorry, procuring a home that you're wanting to buy as an investment property, you're not supposed to use third-party callers in Nebraska. Now every state has different rules. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Awesome. Cool, man. I love to, to, to hear that. So I think the moral of the story is back to the question I asked is you build your team and there's the myth that you just are sitting on the beach in Costa Rica, sipping yeah. on pina colada. but that's not the case. It's there's the business you're in and then the business you're getting into. It frees you up to go focus on something else that you're passionate or that you're excited about or that you want to sink your teeth into. Yeah. Is that, is that the I, honestly, dude, story? like I've sat on that beach sipping the virgin pina colada uh, hundreds of times. I just got back from South Africa. I was there for five weeks, two months ago. I was in Jackson Hole last week and Temecula, California last week. I spend probably a third of my time traveling. A lot of that's with family. Some's not with family, but you can be a broke agent and go sit on the beach in Costa Rica, you know, have mom and dad pay for you to get there or something. I don't know what your plan is with that, but like credit card, 
You there you go. Right. Just load up the credit cards until they start sending you all the nasty grams. So the thing is, like, I don't want to sit on the beach unless I know I've got money coming in. I don't want to relax yeah. until I know that everything's running. My biggest fear is the actually actually is the reverse that people don't choose to ever slow down. They spend their whole life chasing the dollar. It's never enough. It never gives them the satisfaction that they thought it would. And then they're 65 and they're like, I never sat on the beach and sipped pina colada in Costa Rica. I think a majority of the people listening right now are in that group rather than the group that's feeling guilty for sitting on the beach, sipping pina colada. And so that's yeah. my thing, man. Like for anyone listening, like biggest thing is I spent too much time probably and filled forward too fast, sacrificed too much early on in my career that I now have regrets. Like I didn't spend enough time when my kids were little. And I can make up for it now. I mean, they're 13, 11, nine, but like, I didn't help my wife change very many diapers. I didn't help clean up the kitchen. I didn't, like there's all these things that I wish I could go yeah. back, but I was focused on something and we have to choose where we want to put our time. Like we have to, yeah. we have to decide that's our life and that's, what's going to truly make us happy. And I think being able to self um, discover and know the areas in your life that you want to make sure you pursue the money is just a vehicle. It's an energy to help you obtain the things you want. And the things you want aren't money. Money's paper. Money's ones and zeros in a bank account. So I've had a huge learning curve with that, man. Like figuring out that like, oh, make like a million dollars a year was my number. And I hit it at 31. Like million dollars. Dude, my life at a million dollars was probably five times worse than my life at 200,000 a year. Because with the, with the money comes more responsibility. It, yeah. you know, you're responsible for more things. You have more overhead expenses. It's not always like the solution. And I know that sounds stupid. Oh, that's hard for him. You know what I mean? Like people hearing me say it, but it's true. Yeah. Man. Like it, it, I think there's a couple, a couple of things I want to run with this. One is one of the things I'm extremely passionate about Jeff is um, money's not real. I mean, it's, it's a belief system of ones and zeros and digits on a screen, right? Like it's not even paper anymore. I, I, I still carry like paper money around in my wallet just so I've got like a grand on me all the time. It feels good. But like we know I go to the store, I buy some food and I give them a piece of plastic and I leave with the food. Like that's really physically what's happening. It's amazing. Um, <laughs> it really is. And so it's a belief system. And, and one of the things that I found out is, and there's so many coaches, so many trainers, so many mentors, so many this and that, let me help you make more money. Let me help. Cause like you, once you get this, then you're going to be fulfilled. And that's the part that's missing is the fulfillment. Um, and I went through this big time in, in my, my career. Um, I was just working all the time, especially when I was working on Fizbo's. And what I found myself doing is like, I was, I'm getting high in the middle of the day while I'm working. And what I, what I realized is I wasn't able to deal with the pressure like, like that comes with the growth. And so I would get high, I would drink alcohol, I would, I, and I wouldn't just sit with my, my emotions. And so I'm so passionate about helping people enjoy the process, like enjoy the growth, enjoy the experience and have that fulfillment along the way and, and not have to do it like, like I did, like was getting high all the yeah. time. Well, dude, um, you're, you're, it's awesome. You're willing to talk about it. It reminds me of the bumper sticker that says, don't judge me that I sin differently than you because my vice was eating and I wouldn't eat during the day. I'd get home at seven. I'd be stressed out. I'd eat the dinner my wife made. Then I'd get Taco Bell at 11. Then I'd have to stop at Sonic. Like it was ridiculous. And I don't know if you knew this about me, but I got up to 320 pounds as of last year. So when you asked the question, at the beginning of the call, um, what was the biggest thing from the beginning to where you are now? And I said, what are you referring to? I would have addressed my weight loss journey. Like that's been the exciting journey that I'm excited and passionate about or helping agents grow their businesses. Dude, there's no destination, Colton. Like people, we want to think there's like an end because we watch all these movies or watch documentaries and there's a start and a finish. The true joy comes from the what, what's experienced along the way and the type of person that shows up. It's not when you get to the end. When you get to the end, it's actually kind of depressing because you're like, oh, I did it. That's it. Like it's over. And so I've done a lot of research and spent a lot of time with people that are in their 50s and 60s to learn from their mistakes and ask them what they would do differently. It's a great question to ask somebody you look up to that's maybe in their 50s or 60s that has a lot of more wisdom than we do. And I'll say, hey, if you were my age, 36, you were making the kind of money I make, living the life I live, what would you do different? And I asked that question when I was 20. Um, right when I got off my mission, I interviewed 20 people. And I was very intentional to ask people. And I read the book, um, the top five regrets of the dying, which kind of narrows people's top five regrets into these five categories. 
And I promised myself at that time, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do the same stupid stuff that hundreds of other people have done. So like one of them was living the life someone else wanted you to live instead of living your own life. One of them was putting too much time into work and not enough time into their personal life. One of them was not staying close to friends. You know, our lives get busy and we start losing these people that are important to us. And then when you're older, it's hard to rekindle those relationships. So that's been like a practice of mine in my life just to be focused back on like what's satisfying. Dude, that's the pursuit. Everybody's, a lot of people are not happy. A lot of people aren't satisfied. A lot of people aren't fulfilled. They listen to podcasts and they live off the energy that we exude in the podcast, but then they go home and they're depressed and they go to Taco Bell or they smoke weed and they drink. And I get it, man. I'm, I've been there, right? Um, I want someone today to take one thing away that they say tomorrow or tonight I'm implementing this. And what happens is you build on tiny little wins. Um, it reminds me of the Ted talk where the military general stands up and he, I think it's called how to make your bed. He talks about yeah. how at the beginning of the day you make the bed and then because of that you eat healthy breakfast and then you get your workout in and like all these positive things. My journey obviously has been riddled with mistakes and I've been stupid and offended people and messed up all, all along the way. But I will say I tried my best to learn from every one of those things and self-actualize and see where I needed to improve, what needed to be eliminated, what needed to be added. The fear shouldn't be failing. The fear should actually be not failing. So I kind of changed the mindset to if I could fail faster than everybody else, I would succeed faster than everybody else. And so I shared um, with a lot of these people. So I did those 20 interviews. When I chose to get into real estate, I did the exact same thing. Um, six months later, I, I interviewed 20 of the top agents in my market. And I, I told every person that I met with that within 10 years, I'd own the number one real estate team in Nebraska. And people remind me of that today. They're like, dude, you were just weird. Like who, who says that first? And then who actually does it after they've said it. But that kind of shows you where my mind was at 22. Like how I got into the real estate business at 22 and said, I'm going to be the number one guy in the state. But I was willing, I like to use the analogy of throwing a hat over the fence. I was willing to give it all. And I, I sacrificed too much, which is now a regret. But I was willing to sacrifice anything and do anything to be successful. So those listening, if you're not making a million a year yet, and you want that, you have to be willing to sacrifice everything. I mean, honestly, like, you have to sacrifice a lot more than you're sacrificing up to this point to be able to get the results. And the true matter of the fact is people aren't successful because they don't put enough time into the thing that they're wanting to be successful at. And that could and be your health, your relationship, time, right? your spirituality. What's that? That's got to be attention time, right? Because how many agents out there are putting time in, getting lost in the positivity and the busyness, but not really propelling forward? Positive really time, right? Time. Smart time. One of the, my favorite questions to ask somebody is, what do you like to think about when you don't have anything to think about? So what, let's ask you that question. <laughs> Depends what time of day it is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, so one of the things that I found is why I, I, for me, why I would turn, and I had food, alcohol, drugs, didn't matter. I was just fucking myself up. But what I found is that I really craved the most, Jeff, was peace and tranquility in my life, right? Mm -hmm. So if for me, what I think about when there's nothing like when I'm, when I'm choosing that, like it's peace and tranquility. It's like, get Do the you noise out. It? So what's that? Do you cognitively say, I want peace and tranquility. I want yep. peace and tranquility. Cool. Yep. I went to the spot where like, I wear this thing on my wrist. It's called presence, right? Like it was all about being present and patient um, because that's where the love of right now is for me. And so there's a couple things I'll do. I'll, I'll go, I'll go to breath work. Like, and if I'm getting like out of, out of my mind too much, I will do more meditation, more prayer, more breath work. Mm -hmm. And I'll say no to the stuff that I committed to. Mm -hmm. um, so it's about for me creating space to create my life on intention. And, and so often I got wrapped up into the stuff that I thought I had to do when really it's just an illusion. It's just like, up so in my brain. it is all an illusion and what perception is reality and we get to create our perception. And so when someone says they're not happy, my follow-up is always, you're choosing not to be. Yep. which is really annoying to hear somebody say that to you and you feel like you're not happy. But I tell myself, so when I'm down and depressed and I'm like, I'm not happy. I'm like, well, no kidding. I'm not happy. I just said, I'm not happy. Why not say yeah. I'm happy, right? And get to your mindset of like the breathing techniques or whatever it is that you know you can do that will bring that good feeling to you. So it's interesting. I took um, about four or five years ago, my doctor was like, dude, I think you might have like some type of a depression because I was always so intense. 
And so he uh -huh. translated the intensity into a depression. So he, he gave me Lexapro. And so I don't, I, this isn't like an ad for any drugs or anything, but I took it for like six months. But the amazing experience that I had after doing that, I stopped taking it because I gained all this weight and it made me, I never felt high, never felt low. It just made me super like boring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But what it did was it showed me what high, what the difference was of high versus low. And I was better at recognizing when I was low. And so then I started learning like the same practice you just shared where when I was low, I knew what I needed to do. And dude, we're talking about this because everybody on here has low moments. It's what you choose yeah. to do with them. Are you smoking weed and getting drunk? Are you looking at porn? Like everyone has something that they do to kind of cope. What we need to do is have the things that help us cope to get through the hard times need to be positive. So working out, meditating, prayer, um, spending time with our family, going, walking the dog, going fishing, hunting, whatever. They need to be positive. Staring at fire. <laughs> What's that? Staring, staring at, fire at a fireplace, dude. Last night I did that. Staring at fire, yeah. staring at um, water on like a fountain. Yep. Water, ice, so, and fire for whatever reason are three things I like to look at too. The um, number one um, in the United States for, for suicide is 45-year-old working class male. Um, oh, wow. And so the pressure that stacks onto the individual um, and just people are, are having, uh, they, they're not being taught. We're not being taught how to cope with this. And this is, this is why I'm so passionate about it because I want to help people. I don't care how much money. Like I had a great friend of mine. Um, this is what slapped me in the face. It was February, 2016. He was 39, doing a million and a half a year, had the Ferrari, the Lamborghini, the nice cars, the sweet house, diagnosed with stomach cancer by July 10th. He was dead that year. And I was mm. like, what is going on here? Mm, right. That sucks, and man. one of the things you talked about is you got great at failing forward. Um, and I was, I was talking to a friend last night. He's, he's had some situations with his marriage. And I said, dude, it's awesome that you're still married and that you can learn from other people's mistakes like mine. Cause I'm, I'm divorced now. And so hopefully as we are making mistakes, we're not only learning from our own mistakes, but learn from other people's mistakes, learn from my mistake, learn from Jeff's mistake, learn from your mentor's mistakes. You don't have to make the mistake to learn from a mistake, right? You're going to make mistakes. So I think that's extremely Dude. important to be okay with fail forward, but you don't have to make everyone else's mistakes, make your own new ones. What's interesting, that's man, awesome. is like you talked about growing up in the Mormon church and I don't care what religion you are, but all religions have a place for understanding that there's what we would call sin and sin and a mistake is definitely different, but there's a, so much guilt in society that's created for sinning and for making mistakes. And it starts in a school. Like if you're in public schools and you're in kindergarten, you make a mistake, you feel stupid. All the other kids knew you made a mistake. And so we were taught to not make mistakes, like that to be mm -hmm. the successful person, you don't make any mistakes. And so people walk around all worried, like, I don't want to start a team and fail, or I don't want to add an agent and have that agent not work out or spend money on thousand calls a day or Sisu and not have it work out. And now I'm an idiot. I failed. I made a mistake. The true mistake is never taking action, which is right. what a majority of society is guilty of. The true mistake is never pursuing your dream. It's never doing that thing like your friend sounds like he lived a big life, which is awesome. I hope that those things were fulfilling to him. Um, the hard thing is we can never judge another person's intent or like right. why they did something that they did. But I have some similar stories. I won't get into details, something very similar to that. And the gentleman that passed away had lived a full, full life. And I thought, wow, how depressing would it have been if he had chosen? He had he was a multimillionaire and he put he put he saved a lot, but he spent a lot. He lived a big life. And I thought, how, mu how much regret would he have if he had put it all away, saving it for retirement and hadn't like lived his life along the way? And so I would tell anyone right now, like if Costa Rica is your place or you thought of somewhere, put it on a credit card and just go do it. You know, if yeah. there's a car you really want to buy, like just go buy it. Tomorrow might not be here. It will motivate you to do another deal. And in real estate, psh, one deal is like, like I always would joke with my wife. I'm like, yeah, it's just one deal. Like everything's one, yeah. cost, one deal. Like, yeah, it's five grand. That's one deal. Let's just do it. Everything's just one deal. Um, yeah, I'm glad with this conversation, come up, man, because I'm really, really passionate about it. I'm glad that you're open about it. And I, and I don't hear um, enough. I, I feel like a lot of the big achievers today are talking about like the grind and the hustle and the success and the money and that stuff. And that stuff's, that I call stuff. It is, I call it crush it talk. Crush Dude, it talk. I can have that conversation all day. I just feel like all of that's all anyone ever talks about, man. So I don't think that's getting to the root of what people's real issues are. I think today we got to the root and there's people that will listen to this and they're going to say, oh, 
they've been smoking too much weed and doing too much Lexapro. They have no idea. Well, guess what, guys? We actually both have a really good idea. Um, I've known enough people. Like I know lots of people that are very successful that are extremely unhappy. And if they were listening to the things we're talking about, they would be in agreement. So pursue uh -huh. your dreams, live your life, no regrets, make changes in the areas you know you need to change, be willing to admit your mistakes and learn from them and celebrate them in some ways and fail forward and you will be successful. You'll be happy. You'll be, you'll feel fulfillment. Well, and, and you know what, like the problem is like, I was smoking too much weed, right? Like that was the problem. And in fact, like I don't, I don't anymore. And it's the happiest I've ever been mm -hmm. um, to this stage of my life. Not that I haven't had great times in the past. I've just, I'm, I'm great being here. Like I'm yeah. just great being here. And, you know, 95%, I just heard they, I went to an event over the weekend with Tim Bilyeu. He was there. Um, I, so cool. I don't know if you know who Jay Shetty is. I got to spend some one-on-one -on -one time with Jay. Nice. Um, Lewis House was there. And, but there was this neuro brain scientist there. And he talked about that 95% of our fear as humans will not harm us physically. So we have all these fears and physically it's not going to do anything to us. Right. So mm. when Jeff says, go to Costa Rica, flip and do it, right? Like make it happen because it's not going to harm you physically yeah. to put it on a credit card or do this. I'm not advocating like spend money. You don't have money management is huge, but get to living life on a bigger level because how, if you live it small, if you live it big, you're going to live, yep. make sure you're enjoying it. Make sure you're present, make sure you're patient, make sure you you're living. I call it the peaceful enthusiasm, like, because you got to have high energy and excitement, but have that peace that comes with it. Um, right. Man, we could go on for hours like this. <laughs> so let's start to bring it back together. What is it that you're passionate and you're, you're stoked about right now? And let's, yeah, let's wrap so, it up. Dude, the biggest thing is my coaching company, Elite Real Estate Systems. I also have my podcast for anyone that wants to talk more about building and scaling teams. Would love to direct you to that one as well, the team building podcast. And then I'd love to get you on my show, Colton. Um, my big thing is coaching right now. So we started expansion teams back in 16. We went to Boston, San Diego, Salt Lake, and Lincoln, Nebraska. And I was upset and frustrated because I couldn't grow fast enough. And I felt like I had a lot of great information to share with the world. And so we sold off all of our expansion teams and we went all in into building a coaching organization that offers group coaching. And we call it uh, modern coaching for the modern agent. But ultimately what we do is we put a $50,000 studio in my office and we live stream all of my agent trainings every Wednesday and Friday. So we do topical on Wednesday and then we do dialogue training on Friday. And that product is $17 a month. So you can be a fly on the wall of the number two team at Berkshire Hathaway Worldwide. Um, we've been number one in Nebraska for five years. And it's all the content that's helping my agent sell an average of 29 houses a year, making 80 grand in Omaha for $17 a month. And then for team leaders, we have a product that's $497 a month, which puts them into a weekly group Zoom call where it's a, it's a weekly coaching call with myself and one of my other coaches. And then there's, it's a one hour call with a 30 minute Q and a afterwards. So in a nutshell, you get 12 hours of training content for 497 or eight hours for $17 a month. Awesome, man. So, so check it out gang, Jeff, thank you much so much for being here. I just sent you a text. I definitely want to get on your podcast for sure. Appreciate, sure. um, I appreciate your authenticity, right? Like that is the thing people are walking around with this identity of shame of I'm not good enough, smart enough, whatever enough. Um, and when we can shift that to an identity and I call it, and it's kind of cliche identity of love, but that place of, of like just a shining light from like the core and we can open that up, crack it open by, by, being vulnerable and sharing like, dude, I'm not perfect. I make mistakes, right? Just kind of like you've talked about, you had that, that you were eating, got to 300 something pounds. How many of you guys watching live or replay have you, something you can connect with, with that, right? You can get to that space of vulnerability dude. and rip that shame off and become the identity of love. Like, yes, sir. Possible. Well, what I've noticed, man, I'm like, I said, I rub my shoulders with lots of big players. It sounds like you do too. And if I go show up in front of them and try to tell them about how great I am, they have no interest in talking to me. But the moment I talk about how I have a challenging marriage or I can't lose this extra weight or I'm, a, I'm really stressed all the time, they'll spend three hours. They'll like take me to the private area and want to give me their advice because passion and happiness comes from helping others. If you're perfect and you've arrived, at least you they perceive you think that there's not a space for them to give themselves to you, to pour their heart and soul into you. But if you open yourself up for criticism, um, 
organized criticism. So it's not in a negative way. Pete, there's a lot of people around you that will share. Last comment, if that's okay, Colton, at least I want to share this with the group. It's something that was really impactful to me as I studied millionaires. They said that your average net worth when you die, your net worth when you die, I'm sorry, will be the average of your five closest friends net worth. And so the same rule applies when it comes to happiness, physicality, in my opinion, um, anything that you're trying to obtain, spend more time with people that already have it. Position yourself in a place to be around other highly successful individuals and that success word based on your perception of success. So you like the way Colton rolls, hang out with Colton. If you like the way with someone else, you know, the way they act, hang out with them, spend more time with them. People of abundance will, will um, attract people like you or whoever watches. They'll attract you and they're open to spending time with you. So like I went out and visited 50 different teams all over the U.S. and just said, hey, can I come visit you? No one said no to me, not one person. Like all these agents all over the country that are very well known were like, yeah, come hang out with me for half a day for nothing. Like I didn't pay them anything. So I have the offer I do actually charge now. We have a whole day workshop, Colton, in Omaha. It's called the team building workshop. So if you go to EliteRealEstateSystems.com, you can check out upcoming workshop dates. We're actually going to be doing one in Miami, Florida in January. We have regionals all over Charleston, um, Las Vegas. And then we also do them in Omaha, just in my backyard. So to learn more about live stream and the workshops, check that out. We'd love to spend some time with you guys. Awesome, man. Appreciate you being here. We will talk to you soon. I sent you that text. Make sure to connect with me, Jeff. I definitely went on that podcast and yep. just learn more about you. I mean, Springs talked a lot about you and how awesome you are. So just oh, love to hear her. Thank you, Spring. <laughs> yeah, she's actually got her summit going on on the 15th. So I'm stoked about that. She's got that going. We've got ours going on next week, guys. If you haven't, I dropped a link in the comments. Um, for you guys watching live or replay before next week, it's the prospecting summit here live in Ogden. I think we've got to have about 50 people in attendance at that event, but we're going to really break it down. How do you generate business today and long-term? And for you, those of you guys are staying for the mastermind portion, we are going to do some amazing holotrophic breath work, transformational breathing next Tuesday night that you will get high on your own supply hallucinating. I don't know <laughs> if you've done this Jeff before, but like it is like the most, and I've done some various amounts of hallucinogens and weed and everything, but like oxygen, like just really breathing that in is like the absolute most amazing, peaceful feeling that I've ever felt. And there's this thing that you have to go through the pain, like physically, have, like you got to check this out, Jeff, like your body actually gets paralyzed in the middle of this process of breathing. Does it have to do with holding your breath? No, it has everything to do with your intake on how much oxygen you're taking into your breath. Huh. So um, no holding your breath. It's all actually breathing in, getting oxygen in your lungs, and you're just alkal alkalizing the entire body, just getting so much oxygen into it. It takes about an hour and a half through the whole process. Wow. But what happens is the, your, your body will literally tense up and you'll kind of like go in your mind and freak out a little bit to where you surrender to the experience. <laughs> but once you surrender to the experience, you begin to let stuff that you've suppressed into your body just for years out of your body. And uh -huh. it's called, it's called dark shadow work, but um, like there's so many dark shadows operating in our unconscious mind. We're not aware of from like when I was five and I spilled freaking red punch in my parents' carpet or whatever stupid right. crap. Right. So we're going to be doing that. And if you guys have questions, check it out. Jeff will connect more. I got to roll out. Thanks yep. for being here, man. We'll Thanks, man. That was awesome. Great interview. Have awesome. a good one. Thanks. We'll see ya. Yeah. Bye-bye.